Hi, everyone. It's my honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Julia Parrish, who's one of our distinguished researchers and uh, one of our distinguished teachers also. She won a Distinguished Teaching Award. And, um, and she's one of the leaders on, on campus that's engaged in a lot of community-based work. So she has a, kind of a joint appointment. She's in aquatic, aquatics and fisheries in the College of the Environment. And she's got an appointment in biology. So she has two homes. She's a natural scientist. And she's going to talk about this concept of citizen science. Um, this involves researchers, hundreds of them, average citizens in many ways. Maybe they're average, maybe they're not so average, but they're citizens out doing research and engaged in, in the work of science. And she's passionate about this. She's passionate about science. She's passionate about leadership. And she's passionate about, about coastal communities. So my question for you to think about is this notion of citizen science. Think about her description of this. And my question to you is, what is the power and potential of citizen science who can be involved how can it how can it be how can it work as a methodology so think about this notion and the power and potential of an equitable citizen scientist community so consider that question and enjoy dr julia parish's lecture hi my name is julia parish and i'm a professor in the school of aquatic and fishery sciences in the College of the Environment, and also I'm a professor in the biology department, which is in the College of Arts and Sciences. And I've been at the University of Washington since 1990, when I came to Seattle as a postdoc in fisheries. So I have been here in one capacity or another for over 20 years. I am old. And, you know, it's uh, interesting having been at the UW for such a long period of time, it's given me a chance to see a lot of change and to be a participant in seeing a lot of that change. I've also moved my career forward. I started here as a postdoc, which is somebody who has a PhD and has a job that's in between graduate student and before going on to get a professorship or maybe research scientist position. Um, in my case, I was a postdoc uh, in two or three different places around the university before I became a professor. And I was a professor for a while until I became an associate director and then a director of an academic unit. In my case, I was the director of the program on the environment. That's the environmental studies program at the University of Washington. And then I actually became uh, the associate dean for academics in the College of the Environment, which is the day job that I hold right now. So I am at least two things in the university. I'm an associate dean in charge of kind of education meets people in my college. And I'm also a professor, which means I have graduate students and postdocs. I have a research lab, a, a set of scholarly work that I do. And I also teach classes but not very many classes because I do that other stuff. So the class that I teach is a science communication class and it's in our new marine biology major, which is a sort of cross disciplinary in between oceanography and fisheries and biology kind of major. So I wanna to talk to you today about who I am, how I got my start, what I do, why I do what I do, and also a little bit about um, the rocking and rolling of how what I do and how I think about it has changed uh, as, a, as a function of, of a lot of stuff. But two main things that I want to touch on just briefly, one is COVID and how it is to live in the era of COVID and the onlineness of it all. And the other is social unrest and how that reflects on what I do and how I think about what I do and how I could do it differently. Okay, first thing I really wanna tell you about is how I got my start in my science, in my scholarly work, in, in what I do. And that's because quite honestly, for most academics, most professors at a university, 
we, we, we are what we do. We don't leave our jobs behind. After we go home, we take them with us. They're our clothes, they're our skin, they're our identity. We are so rolled up in what we do. It's who we are. We, we can't get away from that. And so I'm a scientist, which means I think about numbers. I think about quantitative things. I think about pattern. I'm a natural scientist, which means that I am thinking all the time about the world, how the world works, the, the physical world. But in my particular case, I am really interested in the uh, living part of the world, the biological part of the world, the, the ecological part of the world, and how all of those organisms and species are smushed together in ecosystems and how they get along or don't get along, uh, and how that uh, results in the world as we know it, the, the living world as we know it. My particular brand of ecology is wet and salty. So I'm a marine ecologist. I am really fascinated by what's in the ocean and what's around the ocean. And my part of the ocean is the near shore, part of the ocean really, really near the shore. That is, I am interested in that interface between the ocean and the land. But let me show you some images of uh, where I started, and I can talk a little bit about that. So I'm putting up on the screen uh, a picture of a seabird. And this is a common mer. There are no uncommon mers, just common ones. And this bird, as you can see, kind of looks like a football with wings, right? It doesn't have a really short neck, or it looks like it has a short neck. It's actually hunching its neck down, and it's got a pointed bill and also pointed feet, right? So it's got that sort of football-y shape, uh, and the wings are actually not very long, and they're fairly broad, uh, so they're presenting a lot of push uh, against the air. So this guy is actually not tremendously good at flying long distances. You can actually tell that from the shape of the body and the wings. For instance, if this guy stopped flapping, he would literally fall out of the air. This is not a gliding bird like a really long winged bird, like an albatross. But what this guy can do, which not many birds can do, is fly underwater. So a mer can go from the surface of the water down to maybe three football fields in length in search of fish. This guy can swim around for many minutes uh, under the water uh, and, and go fishing. And in fact, in the, the coastal shelf, so the part of the ocean that's not too deep and right near the continents, uh, kind of in the Pacific Northwest, anywhere that a salmon might go, a mer can go. And in fact, they eat the same kinds of things. Small, silvery, schooling fish, like herring, or in the case of a mer, small sardine, or smelt, or anchovy, or sand lance. So all of the things that we in the marine science trade call forage fish. So this bird is actually a quite social bird. It is the densest nesting bird in the world. And so mers cram together cheek to jowl by not only the hundreds, but by the tens of thousands. And I have spent a long part of my research career basically watching them. So here's a picture of me when I was a lot younger and I'm sitting on the edge of a cliff it's about mm, maybe 120, 150 feet straight down on both sides, uh, which is why I'm in a low chair because it's kind of windy. Uh, and I uh, have a telescope in front of me, and I use that to watch MERS up close and personal. So one way that you can think of how I spent my early career at the University of Washington is literally spending thousands of hours watching MER TV watching sex and violence uh, and birth and death and uh, more fish than you could shake a stick at and recording all of those patterns. Uh, who had an egg? Whose egg had, had hatched? Whose chick made it all the way to growing up and leaping off the cliff called fledging? 
who got eaten by an eagle or attacked by a peregrine falcon, whose egg got rolled off a cliff by somebody else, uh, and counting, lots and lots and lots of counting, who is there at five in the morning and at six and at seven and at eight, for uh, hour after hour and day after day and week after week, and actually year after year, until I could build up a pattern of the life uh, of MERS in a colony. So let me show you a picture of what I see when I look through that telescope. So this is a um, photograph that's just below me on that cliff, and you can see lots and lots and lots of white uh, indentations in the cliff wall. That white is guano, literally bird shit, uh, that is um, gracing the walls, and you can imagine that that makes it really stinky. It does. This island, the island that I did my work on, is a very, very stinky island because there are tens of thousands of birds nesting on it, which also makes it a really loud island. There is not an hour of day or night that there isn't some kind of seabird making a lot of noise because there are day active or diurnal birds and night active or nocturnal birds on this island. So from this vantage point, looking this way and actually being able to zoom in on some of these MERS, I basically recorded all of their lives, all of their breeding lives while they were on the colony in order to put a story together. And I used that story over time to say something about what was happening to the population. In this particular case, the population was going down uh, because one of their predators, bald eagles, was going up in population. And it wasn't so much that the eagles were attacking the adult MERS that is eating them. Uh, it's that they were scaring the MERS. Uh, they would fly by and scare the MERS off the cliff. And when they did that, um, the MERS would leave their eggs behind and gulls would come in and eat the eggs. So it's a really interesting intersection between the MERS and the gulls and the eagles that set the stage for MERS to experience reproductive failure or inability to produce kids in a year. And that happened for several years at a time. So that's just a normal ecological interaction. And the interesting part about it, and the human part about it, was that there were a few things that people did inadvertently, which also depressed the MER population. Two things that I'll name were marine pollution. So MERS are exquisitely sensitive to oil spills. And there were oil spills in the area. So that killed some of the adult MERS. And the other thing that happened is fishing. So net fishing in the area also caught MERS. Remember I told you that they fly underwater and then go anywhere a salmon can go? So when there are nets out for salmon, the MERS would fly into them and they would get caught and they would drown. So there were two things that were depressing the population of MERS um, that humans were doing. Um, humans were also doing a set of things that were buoying up the population of eagles. Um, two things that I'll name is uh, conservation success. Habitat was coming back, and so eagles had more and more places to nest, um, and they didn't have to, um, they weren't prey to pesticides as they had been in earlier years. And also at the same time, the nearest town to the island that I was on uh, had a, a, a really big recreational fishing community. And all of those guys that went recreational fishing would skin uh, and gut their catches every day at the same place um, and throw all of the carcasses in this really big container called the gut wagon, which would be taken out of the bay and dumped at sea every day at five o'clock. And that was like an eagle feeding bell. And all the eagles, dozens of them from all over the area would come and feed. So there was a big, big population of eagles in the area. And so a lot of eagles flying around and the eagles were influencing the MERS. So this normal ecological interaction between MERS and gulls and eagles kind of went cattywampus because of things that people were doing. And it took me about 10 years to figure all that out and that people were really taking an ecological interaction and making it a conservation problem between MERS and eagles. And it took us a while to figure out how we might be able to structure change, not only in this one place, but actually all the way up and down the coast. And so this is the first big thing that I want to say to you. As a natural scientist, as a conservation biologist, as a marine biologist, it takes time. 
to know the system that you're working in. You have to be patient. You have to go back again and again and again, and you have to get wet and you have to get cold and you have to take the data over and over and over again. Science is about exploration. Science is about discovery. It's about not knowing something, being curious about it, and then going and trying to figure it out. And it's as much about going down the wrong road and thinking, "Mm, messed up, and having to back up and go down another road. So if you're a science student and you think science is about walking into a lab and just doing what the lab manual says, and that's science, you're wrong. That's about gaining science skills, but it's not about doing science. Science is about discovery, and sometimes you are fortunate enough to discover really amazing, exciting things, and even things that are going to make a difference. That's what I call actionable science. So I've talked to you a little bit about me, the marine scientist, me, the marine ecologist. Now I want to talk to you about what I do now, the main program that I run now. It's actually a citizen science program. So that's a program where people and scientists come together and they co-create and they co-participate in making science happen. And usually it's science that one side or the other side can't do by themselves. So in my brand of citizen science, it's not that the people can't collect the information by themselves, they can. It's very simple, it's very straightforward. The thing is that the pattern, the scientific pattern, what's cool about it is realized at a really big geographic and also temporal scale. So one person, one one team of people, one lab of people could not possibly do it alone. We need a really, really big group to do it. So my program is called COAST. Uh, You can see it here, COAST with two S's, and that stands for Coastal Observation and Seabird Survey Team. So Seabird Survey two S's. It's centered at the University of Washington. It's about 20 years old. We started it just about at the turn of the millennium. And it has two data collection programs, one that's been going the whole time, that's about beach birds, uh, and one that started in about 2016, that's on marine debris. So coasters are coastal residents, people who live near the shore, people who visit the coast, the beach, on a regular basis. They have a particular affinity for one or more uh, beaches. They like to go visit them on a regular basis, see what's going on, see what the changes have been. And Coast just taps into that strong sense of place uh, and wonder and curiosity that those people already have and allows them to know their beach in one new way, um, uh, in this particular way uh, with, with dead birds. So here's what it means to uh, participate in COAST. We'll teach you how to survey your beach or search it in a standardized fashion from the same start point to the same turnaround point and from the water's edge up to the beginning of the live vegetation. So you yourself or you and the pair or maybe a team are going out and you're searching that beach comprehensively, either for marine debris, your subsample for debris because there's a lot of trash on the beach, or... Um, for marine birds, in which case you're going to sample the whole beach. And when you find them, marine birds, that is, and these are not live birds, these are dead birds. So literally carcasses that have been washed in on the tide and deposited on the beach. Uh, Your goal is to collect data and try and figure out what that carcass is. So the first thing that you do is figure out what the foot type of the bird is. There's a close-up of a bird foot shown here. Just outrageously, outrageously red. Um, Three forward-facing toes. There's no hind toe on this bird. You'll just have to believe me. I know you can't see that in the photograph. Um, And the toes are are webbed together. So three webbed toes is actually the foot type of a particular family of birds, in this case, the alcids. Um, And the common myrrh that I showed you earlier, that's an alcid. So figure out the foot type, and we use a foot key to do that. Uh, and then take three standardized measurements. So this is a coaster who's taking a measurement of the bill of the bird, kind of from the tip of the beak to the start of the feather line or the hair line. So a straight point-to-point measurement um, across that um, curvy surface. Uh, There are two other uh, measurements that are made, and then um, there's a photograph that's taken. In fact, we do two uh, photographs 
one of the back shown here, and then this inset photograph of the belly. And you can see, nice thing about taking photographs of dead birds is you can pose them, you can brush the sand off, you can open up the wing, and you can actually put a slate in there. So all coast photographs have that slate. It's got a ruler measurement in it so that the data verifier can see that. Um, and it's got the date and the location and the letter code of what the volunteer believes the carcass to be. So here's a summary of what they're doing. They're collecting information about the foot type. They're collecting three standardized measurements. I showed you that bill measurement, but there's also one of the wing and one of the foot that you can see here. And then there's a um, photograph of the whole bird um, with a scale in it. So these really, really basic pieces of information or data um, are the evidence. And it's the evidence that they use along with the beach bird field guide, which we give them to figure out what species is in front of them. But it's also the same information that we use in the Coast Office to independently verify that they got what they got. So Coast is super cool because it means that we can independently verify all of the species data and we can do two things with that. We can prove to science and resource management that we are but good. And also we can help volunteers if they're not getting all the way to species. So all of that is put on paper data sheets in right in the rain paper. And so here's an inset of um, a coaster who is writing the data sheet um, in uh, on the paper. Uh, and let me um, convert that uh, and show you how good those folks are. There. Okay, so walking into training, here's a pie chart of how uh, uh, expert people rate themselves as. So we do trainings all through our geographic environment, which is California, Oregon, Washington, and Alaska. So it's a pretty big range. Uh, and um, the first thing that we ask folks is, well, you know, do you, do you think you're a birder? Do you think you're really good? Are you an expert birder? Um, or maybe you're an intermediate birder or a beginner birder. We all have a category called no experience, and some people actually check that. So if you see in this pie chart, you can see that um, half of the chart where this green arrow is are folks that basically say, hey, you know, like, I, I, I know what a bird is, but I'm not really good at identifying birds. They're, they they want to show up. They want to participate in the citizen science program, but they're telling us, I am not an expert. In fact, only about 15% of folks identify themselves as experts. So that's really kind of interesting. But um, here is a graphic of how good um, coasters really are. Um, and you can see on the x-axis, the horizontal axis, um, this is a function of the number of carcasses that folks have found. So when you start out, you haven't found any, right? You found zero carcasses. They're down here. Um, uh, and these people out here, these dots out here, and the dot is, the dot size is the number of people at a given number of carcasses. So bigger dots are more people. Um, and you can see people out here have found 400 or even 500 carcasses. So what's on the y-axis? This y-axis here is how good they are. How good are they at getting all the way to species if they found a carcass? So what you can see is walking out of a training, about five hours later, we put them at this intercept, right? And the intercept is about at 70%. That is seven out of 10 carcasses on average you get right to species. And that is amazing. That is fantastic because remember, half these folks um, are beginners or no experienced people. They are not expert voters. So what do we know from that? We know the training works. We know they learn. We know they're into it so that when they start on the beach, when they start practicing, going out monthly and actually collecting the data, they're good. It's a positive experience for them. But you can see that they can get even better. This curve goes up and hits a sort of plateau or an asymptote. So after a year, um, they can get, as a population, there's a lot of uh, noise um, dots above and below that red uh, modeled line. But that line is about 87%. So that's almost nine carcasses out of 10 that they can get correct to species. So it's a really positive um, thing for the volunteers. So what do we do with all of these data? Literally thousands and thousands and thousands, tens of thousands, now almost 100,000 data points that are the identity of beach cast marine birds. 
Well, this is the most important thing that we do in Coast. Um, we create a baseline. This curve here is a baseline from the outer coast of Oregon. And you can see it kind of looks like a mountain range um, with that black line. The yellow wash tells you something about the variability around, um, around that line. Um, and it's arrayed over time. So the highest point here is in August. And there's another one that's in uh, winter. And there's a little um, echo peak here in spring. And on the y-axis here, you can see encounter rate. That's the number of carcasses you would expect to find in a kilometer of searching a beach, in this case, in Oregon. And we can break this down a little bit and see who's under those peaks. Um, so this first peak is the post-breeding mortality peak, and it's um, exemplified by common MERS, that bird that I studied for so many years. Um, this is exhausted parents and inept chicks dying. This is a normal part of marine ecology. This next peak here is the winter kill peak. That is because it's cold and it's dark and there are a lot of storms and birds get blown out of the way and they can't find food when it's really stormy. In fact, winter kill worldwide is one of the largest killers of birds because they just can't literally make it um, through the night, through, through cold, dark nights without enough to eat. So winter kill in the Pacific Northwest in the, along the coast of Oregon um, will do in lots of birds, but mainly this bird in northern Fulmar that breeds in Alaska. Then there's a little echo beat, uh, boom here. This is the spring migration. This is when birds that nest to the north of us in Washington are flying back up to the north, and some of them are going to lose their lives uh, and, and come to shore. So those first two peaks, the post-breeding mortality and the winter kill peak, those are normal peaks. Um, the spring migration is something that started in about 2005, 2006. Um, so it's something of conservation consequence that we have to look at. So how do I know this? I know this because I have thousands and thousands and thousands of people who have gone out and collected data for me over the years. Some people as many as, as 15, even going on 17, 18 years, collecting data for me on a monthly basis. That's just amazingly stunning. And because they are out in a place that they know and they love, I can get that information. So I'm gonna show you the largest sense that we roll that data up and turn it into actionable science. Take it from, wow, that's a cool pattern, Julia, but who the heck cares about dead birds on beaches turns it into something more. So now you're looking at uh, a trace, not of uh, dead birds, but you're looking at a trace of sea surface temperature. Uh, and it's set so that the long-term temperature is reset to zero. So anything above zero is warmer than normal, and anything below zero I'm actually not showing you on this plot. And each one of those stripes that goes across um, is a stripe over time, so it starts in about 2006, and it goes through to current about 2020. You can see by that sort of railroad track timeline. Uh, and so a, a yellow golden color is warmer than normal. A red color is a degree, and that's a degree Celsius warmer than normal. And the dark red is two degrees warmer than normal. So that's actually a lot warmer than normal. So two degrees in the ocean environment is, is a huge, huge big change. So I want you to look uh, at this. The top line there is the Chukchi. That's a part of the ocean that's way up almost in the, uh, it's above the Arctic Circle. So it's almost at uh, frozen most of the time. Uh, and the lowest one is California, central to Northern California. So I want you to see two things. One is that um, up north, in the Chukchi, it's been warmer than normal for well over a dozen years. So when Arctic peoples, indigenous peoples from the north are talking about climate change and the impacts of a warming world, they are not lying. They have experienced it first. They have been experiencing it for decades. It has manifestly changed the way they're able to live. The second thing that I want you to see is that at about halfway through 2013, the whole ocean, not just the Arctic, but all the way down into the North Pacific got stuck on warm. So it was much, much warmer than normal. And that warmth pers persisted for years and especially strongly um, in Alaska. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to superimpose big, big beach bird mortality events. 
events where we're not just seeing one or two or even a dozen birds wash into a beach, but where we're seeing hundreds or thousands of birds. And not just one beach, but a whole series of beaches. It might be all of the beaches along the outer coast of Washington or all of the beaches in the Gulf of Alaska. So we call those mass mortality events or MMEs. And MMEs are interesting because they're usually typified by one or several very related birds. So it's not rampant mortality of all birds, but affecting just one kind of bird. And I'm gonna put a big bubble um, on that railroad track for each mortality event. So here are mortality events that we saw before that um, warming transition. And you can see that the bubbles are of different sizes. Some are larger like that Scoter green bubble and some are smaller um, like two rhinoceros uh, auklet um, mortality events or this orange uh, puffin mortality event. So what do we know about before the ocean got stuck on warm. We know there were mortality events. We know that they were um, of different size and we know they affected very different kinds of birds that come from different lineages of birds. Now let me show you what happened when the ocean got warm. Okay, wow, that is a huge difference. Um, you should see right away that the bubbles got a lot larger. They're way overlapping each other. And in fact, there are a lot more bubbles. So frequency went up magnitude went up, but species diversity went down. There were two primary families that were affected, um, the alcids, like MERS, um, and the prosolarids, things like albatross and shearwaters and fulmars. So for reasons that we don't know, this is still a mystery, um, these two families of birds really, really took it in the shorts. And if you add up all of those bubbles over space and time in the Pacific Northwest and Alaska, we're actually talking about millions of birds, millions and millions of birds. So one um, impact of a warming ocean that is pushed by a warming world is a huge, huge change in the ecology of the marine environment and the loss of life of many millions of seabirds because the marine environment can no longer sustain their populations at the level that they are. So that is the large message that's coming out of the COAST program. That is the actionable science. Um, and we turn that science into peer-reviewed publications. That's wonky science stuff, but we also take those and we put them back into science updates on our website so that um, all of our participants can see them. So COAST really has a few principles. One is that we deconstruct science. Um, we deconstruct it into evidence first and deduction second. The second is that we demystify science. We lose the jargon in COAST, right? We talk in real words and we daylight the process of science. That is, this is how everybody can do science together. The third is that we use science. Um, and we say, uh, if you're monitoring scientifically, if you're surveying scientifically, you're bearing witness to what's going on. And you can use that witness, that um, evidence, to take action. So at scale, when we put these patterns together, um, this is what we see and this is what we can do. So I wanna just close this section by telling you just a little bit about who the coasters are. So coasters are real people. Um, about 15% of them are or were in some form of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, about 12% are educators. A lot of them have dogs, like this coaster here. His name is Ollie Olakainen, um, and he's got a husky. In fact, he is a husky. He graduated from the University of Washington. About 65% of coasters are female, so more women than men. Uh, and a lot of them are uh, lifelong friends, uh, like these three, Charlene and Sarah and Helen who go out um, on the beach um, in California every day. About 33% of coasters are retired. So coast is something that you do when you have time and you actually have been able to make decisions about um, knowing what you wanna do. So the average age um, in coast is, is 51. So one point that I wanna really make on that is when you have worked all of your life and you have been able to save money and you have a retirement account or you have a good retirement plan with your employer, you can retire. When you don't, when you don't have a retirement plan, when you haven't been able to save money, when you are working just to make ends meet, you don't retire. 
you keep working. So one of the things about COAST, and this is one of the things about citizen science, is it's actually not available for everybody. It's not available for all publics. It's not available for people who do not have the time, for people who have to work to put food on the table, for people who have to take care of others and their family and don't have enough time. And so that's something I want to return to. There's a big age range um, in COAST um, from age seven to age 87, bumps up into the early 90s. So even though the average age is 51, big, long range. Um, and that is to say, even though this is not a kid-focused program, there are kids, and about 15% of coasters are in two or three generation families. So kids and their parents, kids and their grandparents, so grandparents taking the kids out to the beach, or all three, kids, parents, and grandparents going out. So even though it's a kind of geeked out science program, people looking for dead birds, it's all family um, activity. So I want to talk to you just a little bit about why people join the program um, and why they stay and who they are. So I want to divide things into uh, a little bit about recruitment and a little bit about retention. So recruit, why do you join? Retain. Why do you stay? And we're going to ask those two things. And in fact, we asked those questions of people at trainings in COAST, and then we asked um, those questions also of people who had been with the program for more than a year. So you're going to see these long bar charts, and the bars that are pointing uh, to the left are the beginners, and the bars that are pointing to the right um, are the seasoned participants. So what you can see here is that um, people talk a lot about the birds and the environment and citizen science when they join, but after they've been with Coast for a while, they talk a lot about the beach, about my beach, right? They talk about a lot, a lot about Coast and they talk a lot about science. Um, they also talk, once they've joined for a while, about being outdoors and about monitoring and observing. So they're doing a lot of science talk um, about the beach um, and uh, also about being outdoors. Let me show you something uh, about their identity. So when coasters join, uh, they talk a lot about their friends. Their friends brought them in to coast. They also talk a lot about themselves, right? That they have credentials, that they have the right job, or that they got a degree maybe in biology. They talk about being a citizen scientist. They talk about being a birder. They talk about being retirees. But within a year, they've actually changed how they talk about themselves. They still talk a lot about social things, although they've gone from friends to family. But they talk about being a science team member. They talk about being a data collector. Um, they talk uh, about being a member of the Coast Collective. So when you look at that all together, what we find is that with engagement, um, they're, uh, they've intensified uh, their connection to the coast. They, they've increased their use of science language and they've dropped individual attributes in favor of a science identity. That is, even though they don't say that they're a scientist, in fact, they say, nope, I'm not a scientist. They, they are a scientist. They talk about it like science. They are doing science. They are collecting data. Um, but a really important second point is that uh, the social aspect of science um, comes through. So this is one of my favorite plots. On the x-axis is the cumulative number of unique partners of so different people that coasters have had over time. And this is sort of a ghost plot. So people are layered on top of each other. And people that have gone out a lot, done a lot of surveys, have bigger circles. And people who have only gone out once have tiny, tiny little circles. Um, so where things um, look more intensely colored, it's because there are a lot of people layered on top of each other. And the y-axis here is the mean number of partners. So on any time you go out to survey your coast beach, how many people do you go out with? So look at this um, zero, zero point down here. These are people who have never had a partner and they always go out by themselves. They're the loners. Um, and in fact, this whole box here is the loner box. And that's because even though they may change partners over time, at least half the time, 50% of the time, they're going out by themselves. And then here are all the people in pairs. These are people that always go out with somebody else, and over time they will change partners and, and um, go out with other people. And then all of the people out here are the more gregarious people. They're the people that go out above this line up here, 
with lots of people at once in teams. And over here, towards the red people, will um, over time go out with lots of different people. So look at these guys, these two dots out here. These are folks that have gone out with 60 or 70 different partners over time, even though on average, they're just going out with one or slightly above one at a time. So those are super, super gregarious people. They are telling us that Coast is a, is a social thing. And in fact, we did a social network analysis and I'm showing you the largest network. So each dot here is a different coaster. And the size of the dot is how many surveys they've done. So a small dot is not many and a large dot is a lot. The color of the dot tells us something about the year that they joined. And the lines between the dots are joining people who've done surveys together. So a thin line means maybe one or two and a thick line means lots and lots and lots. And what you can see here is it's an incredible network. And when we look at all of the people in this network together, including the people who just went out once, maybe their guests, it's 949 different people. So the social aspect of Coast, the social networkiness of Coast is huge. So what we know from Coast and from this brand of citizen science is that science is a social event. And even if you don't think of yourself as a scientist, as these folks don't, they're going out and they're collecting really basic data that we can put together into this large pattern that is the documentation of the impacts of a woman world. So I've told you about marine science and I've told you about my citizen science program and I've told you how when there are hundreds to thousands of people working together, every single one on their own beach of their own choice with their own personal connections. Thinking about science, not only as a social thing, but as something that is building a pattern and allowing us to say something and push back against uh, climate change and global warming. The good things can happen. Now I wanna, talk about COVID. So when COVID came along, there was a huge overnight change that happened in Coast. And that is literally that our connection to people got cut. Uh, Coast survives because we have a social contract with people, with communities to come to them we never require anybody to come to the University of Washington. Of course they can if they want to, but they don't have to. We go to them. We operate in about 90 different coastal communities. And during a normal coast year, there's somewhere between 17 and about 30 different trainings that we're going to do. So sometimes every other week, somewhere in the coastal environment. And sometimes those trainings will be 15, 20 people, and sometimes there will only be four or five. We have done trainings in schools, in libraries, in churches, in bars, on beaches, in parks, in people's living rooms, anywhere that the community invites us. And we go there at their invitation. Uh, and once we're there and once we've trained people and once they're signed up for the program, we go back. To those communities. We build up trust over time. COAST is not about just jetting in the scientists saying, oh, do this stuff for me, and then leaving with the data and writing a publication and going on to the next thing. COAST is about trust. COAST is about working together. COAST is about co-creation. And when COVID came, we had to stop because people from the big uh, urban environment from Seattle where COVID landed uh, in the United States were seen by coastal communities as people who were infectious agents. And we're still in that place. In fact, as we head into fall, we're even more in that place. So we can't do trainings anymore. So I want you to look at these graphics. On the top, you're seeing um, on the left-hand side the number of participants uh, per month. That's the number of people that are going out and collecting data and sending it in to us. And the black line is 2020, and the other three lines are years before that, which we're using as a baseline. And you can see two things in this graphic. One is that there's a really short-term dip 
um, in March and then way down in April. And that's because actually lots of the beaches were closed and people couldn't actually get out to their beach. You can also see that that bounced back up once the beaches were open again, people went back to the beaches. And in fact, what they told us is they were really worried about not being able to get out there and get their data. But you can also see that as the months are going on, um, the number of participants are dropping off. And that is because we're not adding any new people. So we haven't done an in-person training since February. And this is really worrisome to me because I'm looking at the slow death of my program after 20 years, and I'm not exactly sure what to do about it. This keeps me up at night. This is a real difference, a real change. Um, on the right, you can see a slightly different way of looking at it. Again, the black line is the 2020 line. Um, and this is when we took a set of people who have been in the program for the previous year, and we say, okay, how long are you going to last? Are people who are in the program uh, dropping out more quickly during the COVID year than during other years, during the other lines? And the answer is yes. So COVID not only had that short-term response, which you can see here, in that um, response. It's having a, a pressing longer term response as well. So the COVID crisis to me as a scientist, as the head of a citizen science program means I may well have to fold the program if I can't figure out a way to get around this. This graphic on the bottom is um, one thing that coasters are doing. It's the uh, month over month rate of the number of people that go out by themselves. Um, so we uh, talk about going out in teams or pairs, um, but a lot of coasters do go out by themselves and that's because they're in protected waters like Puget Sound, um, where they're not gonna be um, crushed by a log or um, drowned by a wave. But you can see that as soon as COVID hit, the number of people um, going out by themselves, these um, orange dots increase. And this only goes through June. Um, it's actually gotten a little bit higher since then. So coasters are trying to take precautions and go out by themselves, but it's really, really hard to do an outer coast beach by yourself. So coasters are being um, beset in a number of ways. Remember, they're older. They're, uh, there's a preponderance of retirees. They want to be safe. They want to go out by themselves. But that puts them in a safety a situation of um, collecting data by yourself on a wild and windy beach. So we're seeing that decline. So how I'm facing COVID and how I'm getting through this um, and how I'm doing my science and my scholarly work and really how I'm able to connect to the people in my program has all been sort of thrown up into the air and we're really not sure what we're going to do. It's a huge change in science. So here's the last bit that I want to share with you. And it's the hardest bit for me because it's the um, thing, I'm, thing I'm least sure about and most uh, at sea about. You're looking at um, a set of data that was collected uh, oh, almost 10 years ago by a set of graduate students at the University of Washington who are working on a meta-analysis, so um, bringing together lots and lots and lots of existing sources of information and looking for pattern. Uh, and they were um, concentrating on biodiversity citizen science. And um, as a consequence of looking at what projects were doing, they had occasion to um, speak with or um, get a, a survey back um, in writing from project managers of biodiversity citizen science programs, and they asked lots of different questions. But one of the sets of questions they asked was about the demographics of the participants in the programs. Uh, and uh, actually not many, they, they interviewed 124 uh, different project managers, and not many actually knew about uh, what the demographics in the program are. And that makes sense to me. I run one and I can't tell you the demographics of all the people. So most people don't record that information, but for the ones that did, um, these are, are the data. And I want you to just stare at this, if you haven't already been, for a while. So each row is a different demographic. The top is um, racial and sociocultural, and the bottom is uh, simple gender. Uh, and um, 
So green means that um, most or all of the participants in the project or the program are of a particular um, demography. Uh, and black means none at all, and blue and red is uh, in between. So I want you to look and notice that for most of the programs who knew something about the demographics, what they said is that most or all of their participants are Caucasian non-Hispanics, right? Uh, and at, by the same token, if you look and see what's in black, right, basically none uh, of the majority of programs were um, Hawaiian natives or Pacific Islanders. Um, but even when you look at Native Americans and African Americans and Asians and Hispanics, there's a lot of red there. That is, there's a few, but not many at all. Um, so you can also uh, see here that there's actually a fair amount of gender balance here, at least in terms of male, female. Um, but the sociocultural and racial and ethnic diversity is, is really different. So when I think about citizen science now, I used to talk about it as the way that everybody could do science, right? That we would open the door of science and people would just come in and do it because we were demystifying it and losing the jargon. And that actually, these data show that that's a lie. Um, that we can open a door, but people are looking in the room and they're saying, do I like what's in there? Do I wanna come in there? And a lot of people are making the decision not to. And it's not only because of economics, it's because of who's in the room. So if you're looking at a group of people and you think, wow, there's nobody like me in that room, why should I join? That's a problem. At the same time, let me also talk a little bit about what's going on in the coastal environment um, from the marine science point of view. So I talked a lot about um, uh, about how coasters put together the information that I could use to say, wow, look at the impact of a warming world of a changing climate. It's killing millions of birds. But there are lots of other things um, that are happening. And so I now think about science, and in fact, my science, I try and think about my science, a science that matters, right? Can I do science that connects people to issues that they care about, right? Issues that directly affect their homes, their careers, their families, their lives. Can we use science in that way? Maybe that is a way that we can reach everybody. So I want to suggest to you that when we think about climate change and marine science, there's all sorts of things going on. These are photographs um, from Shishmarif. It's one of the indigenous communities that we work in in Alaska. Shishmarif is literally falling into the ocean because of earlier breakup of ice. So these people are feeling the physical effects of a changing climate, literally the destruction of their town. But so are these people. Um, these people are uh, Quinault people, uh, and they're on the outer coast of Washington, and they have been razor clamming since time immemorial, but they can't go razor clamming anymore because there are now more and more harmful algal blooms that are getting in the way. Um, and so these people are also seeing their um, lives and livelihoods and cultures change because of a changing climate. But so are these people. Um, these people are relatively new, only four or five generations old, people that have moved into Willapa Bay in southern Washington. Um, and these people are the oyster men there. But they are also seeing their way of life change because of a changing climate, because of ocean acidification. So each one of these very tight-knit, um, very insulated coastal communities all feeling climate change in the marine environment differently could have a louder voice if they banded together, could have a louder voice if scientists interacted directly with them and didn't just come in and say, do this science, but went there and listened. So Coast has done that or started to do that just in a little way. This program is the die off alert program. So when all of those big uh, mass mortality events that I showed you that bubble plot of were happening, one of them happened on St. Paul, which is a tiny little speck of an island um, up in the Bering Sea. And uh, there is an indigenous community um, on St. Paul. It's the Aleut community of St. Paul Island. And Coast works with um, the Aleut community of St. Paul and has since 2006. And when um, all of, when their mass mortality event, which is a puffins, which are the birds 
um, shown here started to happen. Um, uh, it was the fall. Big, big waves coming into the beaches there, like really, really hard to get work done. Um, it's in the 30s. The ocean is starting to freeze up. It's really, really hard to be there. So the guys that were doing the surveys there had to invent a new way of doing coast surveys. Um, and so we worked with them um, and with a, a monitoring program they run called Bearing Watch um, to co-create a new way of collecting the information, which we call die-off alert. And then in the years after that, Coast and um, the Ecosystem Conservation Office of the Alley Community of St. Paul went out and we did, um, we taught people die-off alert, not only in the Bering Sea and up in the Chukchi Sea, but down also in the Gulf of, the, Gulf of Alaska. So um, now, um, coastal Alaskans in, in small communities throughout Alaska, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people have been trained in die-off alert, where you basically just go out, arrange the carcasses, take a photograph, text it into us, um, and we can do the rest. And in fact, a lot of the information that we have on mass mortality events in Alaska in really remote places are because people have learned die-off alert. And that's because we could listen. We could listen to the community and say, that you can't do COAST the way you guys want us to do it. We have to do it in a new way. And that's led COAST to think about how we're acting and interacting with communities, not just indigenous communities, but all communities. And that's led us to create a code of conduct, which you can see on our website. And I'm just showing you the um, entry um, page to it here. We actually have three different codes of conduct, um, one for all of COAST, one that's specific to indigenous communities, and one that's for data users. And it's really made us think in a different way. What are our responsibilities first as a, as a scientist? What's my responsibility and what's my responsibility um, as a professor in a university? And also, what are my rights? And what are the rights of the people that I um, act towards and interact with? And so I think I hope we're at the dawn of a different way of thinking about science and that maybe citizen science can be that true partnership, that way of co-creating and collaborating to do more, to know more, to see more, and really, really importantly, to put those stories together so that we can affect change, positive change, protection, stewardship uh, of the natural places in the world. Thanks for listening to me. Hi, everyone. It's my pleasure and honor to introduce friend and colleague Julia Parrish, who is at Faculty Appointments in Aquatic and Fisheries in the College of the Environment and in, um, in Arts and Science as well. She's got a split, a, a dual appointment. You'll see her bio there. Um, Julia, thank you for a really wonderful lecture that took us in many different places and told us a lot about you and about your work and about our community as well. The first question I want to ask you, though, is about, I, I want to go back to the young Julia Parrish pre mm -hmm. pre university because you you sure. you went to Carnegie Mellon as an undergraduate, but talk about how you got to Carnegie Mellon in the first place and when you decided to be a, a scientist. When did you develop your scientific identity? Yeah, that's that's a fabulous question and um, God, takes me back. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I um, when I was in high school. I was, uh, I was in a, a sort of math and science program, but it didn't really mean a lot to me. What meant a lot to me in high school was theater. Uh, I did a lot of theater and a lot of summer stock. Um, I was a singer. And um, I, uh, I went to college because my father insisted on it. Uh, and he filled out all the applications for me. And it turns out he went to Carnegie Mellon. So I went, right? Uh, and, and uh, you know, that was a really bad reason, really a bad reason. And I, uh, I majored in, in biology, and biology at Carnegie Mellon is, is very interesting. It, it, it may not still be this way, but at the time, 
uh, there were no courses in things that I call skin out, right? Uh, no ecology, no evolution, no population, none of the ologies, right? Cell biology, maybe. And so I learned all of this really cool science, but it wasn't things I could see with my own eyes. And I was really despondent about that. Uh, enough that I was gonna quit, definitely quit. And um, I was rescued by a faculty member who took an interest in me and my case. And he happened to be the assistant director um, of, of the biology program. And he, and he called me into his office and he said, Julia, you, you don't seem very happy here. What's up? What's, you know, what should we do about this? And we started to talk about um, going to field stations and spending a semester at a field station somewhere else. And uh, we looked at those together and he helped me apply to a bunch of them. They were all Marine. And, um, and I got in to everyone, which was a shock to me, shocker. Uh, and I went, I decided to go spend a semester at Duke at the Marine lab there. And m my world was rocked. I mean, rocked. I took every course they offered way overload. I got to do independent research on sharks, amazing amazing right i just nights and weekends you could not get me out of the lab you could not get me off the water i finally understood that science was not about reading textbooks it was about getting out there and getting wet and doing it and asking questions and messing up and getting back in there and figuring it out and that's why i became a scientist that's Mark, your interest in becoming a a natural scientist because you described <laughs> the difference between um well the science in general and and being a natural scientist you're you're interested in stuff that that is wet that's on shorelines that's that's kind of sticky um, yeah. what drew your interest in, in natural sciences in particular well i to me um physical sciences are uh are amazing they are earth sciences are are grand they're vast in time and space uh and they're, they're also pretty precise. You can make lots of very, very distinct measurements. Biology is mushy and gushy, and the ecology part of it is, is even mushier in the sense of things aren't precise. There's a lot of variability. Some years it goes one way, and some years it goes another way, and it takes a while to discern pattern, to really understand what's pushing and what's pulling and what's going on. And that kind of... Um, mystery is really appealing to me, right? To, to really have to try and suss it out. That's, I love it. Being a scientist and being a professor yeah. are, are part of your identity. You describe it as being kind of part of who you are. It's the clothes that you wear. It's part of your, your mm -hmm. identity. It, it's you, mm -hmm. you wear it and you walk in the world as a scientist. So these aren't inseparable things for you. You're, you're mm -hmm. at your heart and soul a professor. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, you shared with our st students, with our audience, an image of you um, on an island with a very big camera, and you're sitting alone. And, and I want you to describe where that island is. And you're watching mirrors up close and personal, and it's just you and, and your big lens. And I want you to bring us there with you. It's a Tatouche Island. Tatouche. I want you, I want you to describe for us. Um, what it's like sitting there and, and put us there on the island with you. How long are you up there? What are the conditions like? What does it feel like? What does it smell like? And, and why does it inspire you? So the first thing that you should know about Tatouche is that it's part of the Macaw Reservation. Um, it is a, a really, really important part of the tradition and history of that tribal nation. And I have um, been utterly privileged to work there um, under a, a, an agreement um, with, with that nation. Um, and, I, and I worked there for, for 20 years. And they are a, a people who uh, are, are fiercely protective of um, their place and their knowledge and also um, fiercely protective of knowledge. They want to know. And so they have been welcoming 
of scientists who are also very willing to um, share the knowledge that they are gaining and give the tribe right of first refusal. And so I just, um, I have to say that out loud um, about the macaw. So in, in the work that I did there, this island is the um, place of the traditional um, whaling and seal uh, and sea lining and halibut fishing. Uh, of the tribe. And so it is an island that is rich, rich in history. I mean, it also holds one of the oldest build buildings in Washington state, built, completed in 1855, the lighthouse. Amazing. So think about this, right? Seattle wasn't really Seattle at all uh, at, at that time. Um, and so um, it is an island that was um, taken over uh, by Westerners and the Macaw were pushed out and it was given back to the Macaw in the early um, uh, 1980s uh, by, by Ronald Reagan, of all people. Uh, so it, it is this rock that has seen amazing things and what it sees now is tens of thousands of seabirds. Seabirds that live in the crevices and seabirds that live on top of the island and seabirds that burrow under the ground uh, and there is not a hour of the day that they're not flying around everywhere. And at night, you, you have to be kind of careful because as you walk on the island, they'll run into you. Uh, you don't really want to be on the edge of the cliff at night. Bad idea. Uh, and I sit, uh, I sit on this one tiny wedge of, of cliff that sticks out, that juts out like the prow of a boat. Uh, and, um, and it sweeps down on either side 100 to 150 feet to the waves and the rocks below. Um, so you can't be a person who's afraid of heights uh, and, and work there. And you have to sit low because the, the wind comes up and it'll, it'll push you over the cliff. Also a bad idea. Um, my husband only visited me once there. Just That's once. It. Just once, yeah. And so um, from there, from that point, I have a per panoramic view, 180 degrees, and look um, south down the coast of Washington. I can look to the west, to rocks to the west, and, um, and see what's going on. I can see the fishermen coming in to the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Um, I can watch the weather come in, and I can see the whales breach. Uh, just an amazing, amazing place. And I can be a little, little part of this really wild natural world where the drama of life gets played out on a daily basis. You described as watching mirror TV. It is, it is sex and violence, yes. So you're there and there are thousands of mirrors around you. Are you spending your entire day there? It, it, it's wet, it's cold at times, it smells bad and you're spending entire days. This is back when you were a postdoc. Yep. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, well, two um, two places where I'm observing on tattoos. One is is that um, is that cliff that I showed you. And yeah, you know, uh, three four hours at a time in a in a season in the summer, hundreds of hours over twenty years, many many thousands of of hours. But the other place, which um, I should have sent you a picture of. Uh, is a little box um, that we crawl into and it's stuck into the salmon berry, which is the predominant vegetation on the island. And, um, and it nestles up to where the myrrhs nest on the, on the top of the island. And, um, and it has windows with one-way mirror glass, like police shows, right? Uh, and the, and the myrrhs are very gregarious. And so they nest right up to the surface of the glass. So I can be as close to a myrrh as I am to my hands right now. Many, many of them, right? Which is also very loud and smelly. But it allowed us to, to really see and to watch those interactions between parents and chicks and just really to understand them as individuals, which I think is really important. Animal behavior, super important. Super fun. So you get to know them and you get to know the ecology of, of this place. Yeah. You also say that they are sensitive to oil spills. Mm -hmm. They are sensitive to 
Um, the conservation success of, of eagles, mm -hmm. um, these are related to policy and, and moves that we've made to, um, to sustain um, eagles. One of the things I take away from this is the very thing that threatens the mer population and the ecology of that space mm -hmm. are things that we humans are, are doing. And so how do you as a scientist who cares so much about the ecosystem reconcile that many of the problems that you're trying to solve are problems that we ourselves have created? It seems like such a powerful dilemma, a powerful moral dilemma. I think it, I think it is, but it's also one of, um, of self-realization and also of the um, realization of the place uh, in the world of humans. So in, in my view, as a natural scientist, we are a part of the ecosystem. We do not stand outside of it. We are it, we, we are in it. And as a part, when we do something, something else happens. We, we, we cannot be outside and, and just watch. And I think the story of the MERS and the eagles and the gulls and how humans put different pressures on, on those different players is, is the story of conservation grown up. That is, we must understand that when we do something, there will be actions and, and reactions. And the trick is that we don't always know don't always know what our actions will provoke. But we can take away that lesson that something will happen. And a clever scientist looks for what that effect might be, right? And a clever conservation biologist, conservationist, knows that there will be ripple effects through the system. And, and we look for those, right? So that we are connected. Is, is to me the lesson that we need to really take away. Mm -hmm. yeah. So speaking of connected, you um, are, are the executive director of the Coastal Observation and Seabird Survey Team. You founded mm -hmm. this, this, this project. I did. And it clearly is a project that you absolutely love and you describe it in your, mm -hmm. in your talk. Um, but this notion of citizen science mm -hmm. and citizen scientists up and down the coast from California to Alaska to Washington and Oregon, you've got hundreds if not thousands of people working together around mm -hmm. conservation issues. Um, what inspired you to start Coast? Well, uh, you know, I, I started it for a real selfish reason. Uh, actually, I, um, I'm, I'm a glutton for data. I want numbers. Mm -hmm. And... I, and I couldn't get enough of them myself. And I couldn't get enough of them by that time with my students. We just, we were a little troop. And, and I, wanted, I, I wanted the breadth and grandeur. You know, it's like I want to be a geologist. I want to see the whole thing, not just, not just one place. And the only way to do that was to get other folks to paint the fence for me, right? Uh, many, many fences, as it turned out. And, and so when I started, people were data collectors to me. And I thought, I'm, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give them a protocol, like a recipe and say, here, do this. And they're gonna do it. I, I'm, not, I'm not gonna think about them because they're gonna just be turning the numbers in. It's gonna be great. And, uh, you know, that's pretty arrogant and, um, uh, and, and, and pretty selfish and self-limiting, right? When you really understand that people who live in the space, who have grown up there, or who have retired there, who, who know that place better than you will ever know it, when you can take advantage of that by really digging in with them to understand what they see and how they see it, to modify the questions that you're asking because they're telling you something, that's when science can really take off. And that to me is a power of citizen science. But it also means you, you're trusting citizens with mm -hmm. some basic knowledge to, to be a part of the, the research pro process, yeah. to co-construct the research yeah. with you. So it's a remarkable act of trust to have thousands of people gathering data and learning along with you because mm -hmm. you turn your attention in the talk to who these people are and how they come to be and what sustains them. Take a moment to describe a little bit about who the citizen scientists are and, and what work they do. So I'll, I'll tell you a story. In 2005, um, we had our first big mass mortality event where birds were dying and washing in. And when that happens, we get a, a lot of press. 
Uh, and when that happens, when it appears in the newspaper, uh, then I get phone calls um, to come give talks in community. And, and in 2005, I got an equal number of, talk, of uh, asks to give a talk from Audubon Society, local chapters, and from chambers of commerce. And I'm thinking to myself, well, those groups seem pretty diametrically opposed, right? What, what do they have in common? And so I asked when I went to talk to them. And what I found out was that for both groups, for very different reasons, these are, these are people, locals who love their place, who want to know more about it, who believe that by knowing more, they can be more in control. And that is true. That is a power that science gives, not just to the left or the right, but to everybody, right? And, and so the thing that knits coasters together is that they have a very, very powerful sense of place. And it happens to be places that are, that are beaches, that are coastal environments. Um, but such an amazing, amazing place where the ocean meets the land uh, and literally deposits gifts on a, on a tidal cycle for us to, to look at and, um, and dig through and understand um, what's going on in, in the marine environment. So, you also so yeah, went, anybody can do that. Yeah, you also went so far as to describe in, in, with some care um, the characteristics of people that have the time yeah. and have the resources to live by the coast, to yeah. spend time on the coast, to, to walk the coast. And you can point out some equity issues there yeah. and the, ten the tensions that lie there. Um, say, say more about, about that. Yeah, you know, there I... There are over 50 and, and right. living in communities and, and have the time to do this and likely retired, many of them retired. Yes, definitely. Um, and, and uh, you know, I, I guess I have two almost um, oppositional things to say. One is retirees are often the forgotten people. Uh, we did a, a survey of biodiversity scientists, people who had published in, in peer-reviewed journals um, on biodiversity about who they would trust and who they would not trust to collect data. And they would trust college age people, people in college, people with a college, adults with a college degree, but they wouldn't trust retirees. And I thought to myself, really? You know, if you're a college professor and you retire, does your knowledge go away? Does your curiosity go away? So, so retirees often don't have the same um, street cred uh, in, in, in citizen science programs, but they do have the time and they know what they want to do, right? Because they've, they've, they've worked their whole lives. So they know what they want to do and what they don't want to do. They're fabulous people. But they're also people who can retire, people who have literally the retirement income. And there are many, many people along the coast in small places who don't have the economic um, ability to retire. And I think a lot about those people, Ed. I, I think about those communities. I think about fishery communities that don't have the resources that they once had. Um, there are lots and lots of places along the coast where people have to work their entire lives and they have no less curiosity and they have no less connection to place. They merely have less time. And so I think that one thing the academy, the, the university has to do, must do, is reach out to those people and provide the services um, and the ability to engage and do science that we can for people who are more well off. I, I just can't stress that strongly. Julia, in, in your talk, or Dr. Parrish, I should call you Dr. Parrish. Sorry, no, no, you should call me Julia. It's okay. okay. Um, you talk about a, a couple of really, really big, important issues that are going on. First, the impact of of environmental crisis of, of climate change on indigenous communities, mm -hmm. uh, the Macaw, the Quinault, and, and others, and um, and that is for, for boating. So you talk a bit about, about that. And I, I want you to speak a little bit about the, um, what, that, what that challenge pr pr presents to us. And um, this is of course on 2020, COVID-19 hits a pandemic, and you have a research project, Citizen Science, that has hundreds, thousands of researchers out in groups together, out on the coast, teamed together, and suddenly um, the pandemic hits 
and we're sheltering and we're separate and social distancing and it impacts your research and your project directly. So those two impacts, environmental change on indigenous communities and COVID-19 on your research, talk about the, that, those impacts. Yeah, so environmental change um, on, on coastal communities, I think it is impossible to work in the coastal environment and not understand uh, the, 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 the various impacts of a changing climate and um, more CO2 really in the atmosphere, right? That, 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 that is pushing a change in temperature, that is pushing uh, a change in weather patterns over the long term, aka climate, right? Uh, that is rearranging ecosystems, but it's also acidifying the ocean. Uh, and that is literally dissolving the shells of little things. Uh, little things that stay little like plankton and little things that grow big like baby oysters or baby clams. And, and all of those things are, are felt by coastal residents. They are, are felt as a change in the things that they can fish, they can harvest from the ocean. Uh, they're literally felt as a change in when, uh, when the ocean ices up. In, in the north. So if you have spent not just the last 10 years or 100 years or 1,000 years, but 10,000 years or more living in one place in one way, and now it's a different place, I, I just, it's unimaginable how that changes culture. And yet it does, it must. And so thinking about that and, and being one tiny, tiny little part of how people might know and get to record and, and keep the pulse of their place, uh, I am privileged beyond belief to be working with communities that have been there so long in, in, in that. And then COVID. And I'm not in, in the communities anymore, right? Because, because here I am in Seattle at the epicenter of where COVID lands um, in, in our country and suddenly everybody from Seattle could be infected. Uh, so we had to, we shut down immediately, immediately in, in coast. And that is because the last thing, the very last thing that I ever want to do is, um, is, is put pressure on, on coastal communities. I, I just, I just can't do that. So we, we interact now as you and I are doing now, um, on, on Zoom, the, these, these two-dimensional personas. In fact, um, this weekend, I'm going to give my first wildly experimental um, teaching people to find dead birds on beaches via Zoom, right? And uh, I have no idea how it'll go, but we were rolling with those punches and trying to adapt. And, you know, I, I guess what I would say is, um, I find people in coastal communities to be resilient beyond belief because they have to be. And I think that that is exactly what we should be in the academic environment. We, we are just as able to be resilient, to roll with it, to change, to be creative in new ways, to adapt, to adapt socially. So we're trying to keep our head above the water in that way. And my final question is kind of a two-part question for you. The, in 2013, you were invited to, to come to the White House and speak on public engagement in science and, and scientific literacy. I believe Barack Obama was president in, in 2013. And one of the things that I, that I make note of in, in your bio and in the history of your work, um, Dr. Parrish, is you're often often called on to to as you're often called on as a leader in in the community. Our students often call you call on you to do leadership talks. And one talk that you gave uh, to our students several years ago, you said, "Power comes from respect." And you talked about your definition of leadership. So this is a leadership course, in essence. It's a leadership course on 2020. Uh, talk about why you're selected to talk on leadership so often, like at the White House, or why do students call on you so often to speak about leadership? And talk about that concept of power comes from respect. I, yeah, I, I think that um, there was a point in my career at the UW when I was, I was actually uh, an associate director. So I was a second in command, right? 
uh, in an academic unit. And uh, it was a very tumultuous time in that, in that unit. And I was doing my best to support the unit and support the director, support the leader, uh, in, including telling him, do not step down right now. We, we need that constancy. We, we need you. But I woke up one morning and I realized, ah, gosh, I'm just waiting my turn. And, and that's a dumb idea, uh, right? We, we, we all only have whatever time we have. We, we need to get out there. We need, to, we need to try new things. We need to explore. And I thought, I'm, I'm, not, I'm gonna stop waiting. I'm gonna just get out there and, and, and be who I am and, and try things and maybe hopefully fail fast, not fail slow uh, and, and not step in it too much and discover who I am. Uh, and, and, and carve my own path. And I think that is what um, everybody has to do. Every, every, every student, every postdoc, every faculty member, every staff person, you have, to, you have to carve your own path. You have to try it out. That to me is, is leadership. It is, it is taking that chance and, and doing it and trying to do it well and with others, right? Not pushing people out of the way, but but joining hands, co-creating. Th that kind of leadership, I think, breeds respect. Because people look and say, well, okay, you did it. Maybe I can do it too. And, and, and the very thing that we should then do is turn around and extend a hand and say, come on, come on, join me, right? Go, go in front of me. That, 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 I think, is, is a leader. It's not the person out in the front of the group. It's the person who facilitates. I want to thank you for, for being such a good and devoted and passionate scientist. I, I want to thank you for being such a devoted leader. And I want to thank you for encouraging all of us to be good citizens, good scientists, and um, in a more thoughtful public, Dr. Parrish. Thank you so much. Ed, thank you.